I am working in the Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliances team at the Education Audiovisual and Culture Executive Agency, uh, which is the agency that co-financed uh, the Spring uh, project. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, uh, team because I really believe that Knowledge Alliances uh, projects are very innovative projects, uh, result-driven ones, and uh, that they are quite uh, successful ones. For those of you who might not be uh, familiar, I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, people today are partners who are involved in, uh, in SPRING but maybe some external participants are not very familiar with uh, knowledge alliances. So uh, let me summarize the main uh, points about this uh, uh, type of projects. They are part of the Erasmus Plus family, but inside Erasmus Plus, uh, well, you know, Erasmus Plus is a very big program and inside there is really a variety of different actions and different initiatives. What really characterize uh, knowledge alliances is that in every Knowledge Alliances project, we need to have two main components, uh, higher education institutions, the university world on the one hand, and the business world on the other hand. So this is really uh, the key point of Knowledge Alliances. It is what distinguishes this project, this type of project from other Erasmus Plus uh, uh, initiatives. Um, they are open to any discipline, as we will see later on. Uh, we have really uh, currently projects in, uh, in really so many fields. And they are uh, innovative projects. The main uh, aim is really to boost uh, Europe's innovation capacity, to foster innovation in Europe. So innovation is the main uh, objective of knowledge alliances, but inside we can, uh, we can basically see like some other uh, aims of this, uh, of this knowledge alliances projects. A lot of projects want to develop um, new approaches to teaching, to teaching and learning, uh, new curricula, new study courses. Sometimes it is a, a full, um, basically a full program, a full uh, master program even. Sometimes it's a smaller courses. Uh, a lot of projects, uh, uh, obviously, because they have this business uh, component, they want to uh, stimulate entrepreneurial skills uh, among the participants and also stimulating the flow and exchange of knowledge is another theme of knowledge alliances. As I said, we, uh, we've been financing throughout the years uh, projects in, in basically all possible fields. Uh, this, uh, uh, this list uh, in the slide is far from being uh, complete. Um, on, obviously, in recent years, uh, we've been seeing, uh, for example, an increase of projects in the field of green economy, uh, circular economy, and also we have uh, quite a lot of knowledge alliances projects in the areas of of, uh, health and uh, uh, well-being. When it comes to the outcomes of, uh, of these uh, projects, as I said, um, new curricula, new study programs, uh, new uh, courses or modules is one of the main outcomes. Um, other, uh, other projects um, aim to develop uh, new uh, learning or teaching methods, uh, open educational resources, MOOCs, uh, or uh, guidelines on uh, university enterprise uh, cooperation, uh, e-learning courses. So it is again uh, uh, very diverse, uh, but they are all basically aiming to, um, to develop something that doesn't uh, exist uh, hopefully in uh, Europe. I also would like to give you uh, some numbers about uh, knowledge uh, alliances because I think it is interesting to, uh, thanks to these numbers, to see a little bit this growing family of uh, Knowledge Alliances project. The uh, action, Knowledge Alliances, uh, was born in 2014. It is at that time that the European Commission decided to launch this uh, initiative inside Erasmus, uh, the Erasmus Plus program. And at that time, the available budget from the uh, European Commission side was a little bit over 8 million euros. And with that budget, we could finance uh, 10, the first 10 uh, knowledge alliances. Again, a similar situation uh, in 2015, 
10 projects. From 2017 onwards, there has been an increase uh, of budget and therefore also obviously an increase in the number of selected projects. Uh, we arrive at uh, 2018, which is uh, the very important year for you because this is the year uh, in which uh, spring was um, was financed in the 2018 call, uh, in which we actually saw a, an increase of budget, 28.8 million euros, and we could grant uh, um, 31 projects. From 2018 onwards, we've been able to uh, finance uh, every year over 30 projects, between 31 and 33. But what I want to underline is that um, competition is very tough in uh, knowledge alliances uh, selection. The budget is, uh, has been increasing, but it is not enough to, to really uh, finance uh, a lot of uh, projects. Therefore, only very good applications can be, uh, can be successful. And I'm very happy that uh, Spring was one of the selected projects in 2018. Um, this year, uh, well, the last call in 2020 selected uh, 32 new projects uh, that have just uh, started in January 2021. So overall, we have a really a growing family of uh, 158 uh, Knowledge Alliances projects. Only uh, like 40 of them, around 40 of them are now finalized. Uh, the old ones, uh, those from 2014, 15 and 16, but we still have a big community of uh, over 115 running, running projects. And uh, I just uh, included in my slides, uh, just for, for curiosity, the list of uh, projects uh, that uh, were selected together with uh, Spring in uh, 2018. Uh, so it is really in the same, uh, uh, the same generation of projects from 2018. As you can see, we really have very diverse project from uh, uh, rural, uh, let's say, rural issues to uh, uh, precision pathobiology for disease models. Uh, we have a, um, a project, European hub in the field of essential oils, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, prevention of, of musculoskeletal disorders. As I said, health and well-being is always a very hot uh, topic in knowledge alliances. So it's really, it's really very interesting uh, for me to uh, to follow a lot of these uh, projects. Um, we are a small team at the executive agency, and we really try to uh, each one of us to follow. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of projects, and uh, in the third slide we can uh, see uh, spring being part of this uh, of this family. And I want to add a personal note. I'm very uh, happy to be the project officer in charge of monitoring the spring project. First of all, because there is an excellent cooperation with uh, with Salvo and with Celia, uh, and second because I really believe really in the importance of this uh, of the topic of this uh, of these uh, projects uh, uh, the importance of family businesses which are at the heart of the uh, european economy and uh, family businesses that uh, basically nowadays might be also facing a lot of challenges during the uh, covid pandemic so uh, in thanking you for, uh, for your attention, I included in my slides uh, some uh, links uh, that you might want uh, to check uh, later on. For example, we have a publication that puts together like the main uh, information uh, of all the projects financed uh, from 2014 till 2018, and Spring is part of this publication. I'm uh, at the moment trying to update it uh, to include the, the new projects, but you, want, you might want to check uh, this, uh, this publication already or to have a look at the uh, Erasmus Plus project results platform that includes all the projects, uh, not only knowledge alliances uh, funded by Erasmus Plus or at the results of the recent, uh, uh, let's say, meetings uh, that took place in, in Brussels, uh, cluster meeting for knowledge alliances and the university business forum in which I had the pleasure also to uh, to meet uh, Salvo and uh, Celia. And uh, if you have uh, questions now or later, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you again for this invitation and I look forward to this web and to the next uh, ones. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Lucia. Thank We're very happy to have you with us.
I must say that I think you have connected uh, in the most uh, relevant uh, webinar of the series of webinars we're organizing uh, during uh, January, uh, uh, January, February, and starting of March. So it's been uh, 10, uh, I think, webinars all together. Because today we have with us as the main speaker, the Secretary General of the European Family Businesses, Mr. Jesus Casado. And you mentioned also that uh, family businesses are the backbone of the European economy, and we all agree with this. That's why we believe this is a very important project. And by helping European uh, family businesses to recover from the current uh, economic uh, crisis post the pandemic again, and become more competitive, more innovative, and, and more entrepreneurial, we will really contribute in the um, European economy. I would like to say a few things about Mr. Jesus Casado. He has been appointed Secretary General of the European Family Businesses since 2006. EFB is a federation of 15 national family businesses associations based in Brussels. EFB aims to promote policies that are conducive to long-term entrepreneurship in Europe. Its members, more than 9,000 family business owners, represent directly a turnover in excess of 1 trillion euros, which contribute, contribute more than 9% of the European GDP. Uh, Jesus started his career as a lawyer in Telefonica, but soon in 2001 joined the Instituto de la Empresa Familiar, the Spanish Family Business Association, where he started as regional director, then international director and deputy director general. IEF represents around 100 family business owners, which contribute to 70% of the Spanish, Spanish GDP. In 2018, Jesus became a member of the advisory group at Lorente y es Cuenta. I really apologize for my pronunciation. The leading Spanish Family Relations and Communication Agency. Uh, Jesus Casado has also been a member of the board of the Family Firm Institute, uh, FFI, as most people know it, and a member of the executive committee of the Family Business Network, FBN, which present in more than 40 countries, which are present in more than 40 countries. Um, the experience gathered in, in the field of family businesses led to his appointment as a member of the European Commission Expert Group on family business between 2008, 2009, and of the high level group of administrative burdens uh, in 2013, 2014, reporting directly to the president of the European Commission. Jesus Casado has also been an academic collaborator at ESAID and EAE, a member of the board of several foundations um, in different countries. He has been a speaker in a... I think it's fine, Celia. Eh? <clears throat> so we cannot hear you. As I should start, perhaps. <laughs> yes. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we, we can okay. hear you. So let's... So Celia, I will start then. Um, well, first, first of all, I, will, I would like to thank you, Lucia, uh, because without her, and of course the support of the European Commission, this project uh, would not exist. So thank you, Lucia, for, for, for your support, for, for accepting and being eligible in this project. And we are really happy uh, to serve as a tool that would help uh, most of the family businesses in Europe, if possible. Um, and that's obviously uh, thanks to the European Commission and the support uh, to creating this project. So, we really are very uh, grateful for, 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 this, for this grant and for this support. Um, and then, well, thank you, uh, Celia. Thank you, Salvo. Those are the, uh, and Peter here present at some point. Those are the, 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 the leaders, I would say, of, of this project. Um, and then um, today, um, I, was, I was attending a couple of seminars before that. I was thinking of giving it a, a a different approach to my presentation and try to, um, to extract um, some practical lessons uh, that I've been well experiencing that family businesses that I have seen uh, um, have taken during this, this crisis and try to create a conceptual framework to understand a little bit 
what happened and what could have been um, well, the best possible scenarios for acting in that sense. So the first part will be lessons from COVID-19. Um, I will go very quickly on, on about the, some myths about family businesses, and then I will focus um, uh, about very concrete examples of, of what I considered the examples of resilient and successful companies um, in Europe, namely uh, the Enokia, uh, which are the companies that have more than 200 years old, uh, namely uh, the Hidden Champions. I will explain what is before. And then I will put a very concrete example of uh, the Japanese examples as example of millennial uh, uh, um, companies and how, how they've done it. And if there is time, I will finish by uh, explaining a little bit why, as a summary, why that makes family business uh, being a different species because the essence of the family business is, is different um, and thus they behave in that way. So let's start by um, talking about the lessons from COVID-19. Um, in fact, it's been more than one year since COVID started um, and a lot have, has happened. But when in March, April, uh, the pandemic started to, uh, to, to become real, very few businesses owners took the potential for a crisis seriously. They were saying, well, this, this will not last. Well, this will not have an impact. Um, we, ha we had warnings and, and close calls such as SARS, Ebola, the swine flu, and so on. But why most business owners and those in particular family business owners that I know didn't react to that? Um, in a survey conducted by my, my common friend, Joe Astrakhan, which I consider one of the best um, researchers, if not the best researcher in the world of family businesses, um, he's been conducting a, a survey uh, among large business owners, especially in the US. And the result was that 60% of those business owners were prepared for a crisis uh, of a cyber attack or a digital crisis, but only 6% were, they were prepared uh, for a pandemia, only 6%. Even uh, if I may, I may, I may quote uh, a Nobel uh, Prize, um, Joshua Lederberg, who in 1990, and let me read, said, some people think I'm being hysterical, but there are catastrophes ahead. We live in evolutionary competition with microbes, bacteria, and viruses, and there is no guarantee that we will be the survivors. So that has been, um, summoned by a lot of scholars, experts, but the business community didn't take it for, for real. Uh, I will try to um, analyze um, why did it happen? Why did so many people minimize that uh, threat, which was real? Because we, we don't have to forget that um, this pandemic was not a black swan, as Talib would uh, define it, because it was predictable. We knew it would come, what we didn't know is when and what the consequences would be. But there was a real threat that would come. And second, what can we do to make sure that we make the appropriate preparations for future pandemics and other sources of existential threat? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about, I don't know if you've heard about the um, Stockdale paradox. Stockdale was an admiral um, who was prisoner in the Vietnam War. And then he made an analysis afterward, he came back. Uh, he made an analysis of who were the most probable type of prisoners who would uh, likely not return alive being a prisoner there in Vietnam. And he said, those are the optimists. And I have nothing against the optimist, but let me, let me explain why I say that. The optimist, uh, a prisoner in Vietnam, would say, according to Stockdale, well, um, we're going to be out by Christmas. Christmas would come, Christmas would go, and then they would think, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come, and Easter would go. And then 
we're going to be out by Thanksgiving and then a new Christmas, and they died of a broken heart. So what's, what can we say about this Stockdale paradox? And, 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 let me, and let me just read about it. That's, that's the lesson from the Stockdale paradox. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Basically, what Stockdale sec says is, we have to be, we have to think for the better, but we have to accept the fact and we have to confront the fact. And why I'm saying that is because a lot of people when the pandemic came, didn't confront the facts. And they thought, they say, well, uh, that's gonna be temporary, that will not affect us. Um, so why, what are the roots of that happening? Well, um, I've been analyzing a little bit together with some colleagues, uh, namely Joe Ostrakhan, the, the roots of that happening. And um, I will name four reasons for that. One is uh, because we tend to follow the crowd. This is called the bad wagon, um, the bad wagon paradox, which is we we will not we will not uh, think out of the box. We will just follow what other people do, um, and and part of that is an obsession of the best practices exercise. Everything has to be best practice, right? Uh, you cannot you cannot afford to be different. Let me put an example of of a very concrete family company that uh, for me was an example during the crisis. Uh, we had a conference call already in May. It's the Haniel family, one of the top German groups, more, by, more than 5,000 employees. Um, well, it's an it's a incredible group that um, has um, um, uh, roots internationally everywhere. And they said, well, this COVID crisis uh, is a real challenge. And there are real opportunities. There will be real opportunities because the world will be different. So what they did is that being German, practical, uh, they said every employee of my company will devote one hour a week to concentrate and think about the new opportunities that may arise in the new COVID world. That for me is an example of not following the crowd. Okay, it's just something what I would say a best example of what uh, should be a good practice in that sense. What is another root um, why people will not react to, to this uh, fact of the pandemic? Because we mistakenly believe that because something has not happened in the past, will never happen. That's we, we could call it the normalcy effect. Um, we see now with the populist arising uh, again as, as they did in, in the 30s in Europe. Um, it could happen again. I'm not saying it will happen the same way, but it could happen again. The third one is that we tend to avoid thinking of things that are negative. Um, I would call that the optimism bias and only tend to information that supports our point of view. I would call it the confirmation bias. And we are trapped in that sense. If we have to be only positive or we have to confirm everything, we will never be able to, to really be open to something else that may arrive. And the fourth route is that sometimes we are too quick to default to helplessness in the face of a challenging situation that we have not yet seen. And there is where long survivors, those family companies of more than 100, 200 years, they have an advantage. And, and if I have time, I will explore that afterwards with, with the Henokian, because I think we have a lot of things to learn from them in terms of um, how they have coped with a lot of difficulties during their long life and perhaps that's why they thrive 
where others don't because they they know they have survived crisis even more important than this one and that gives them confidence just to put an example uh, Peter von Müller, he's a member of uh, my German association and member of the Enochia. By the way, Enochia is the group. I have uh, an association, uh, it's within our association as well, our federation is the association that gathers all the companies in Europe that have more than 200 years old. Um, so and Peter was telling me, he's in the, in the car industry sector, he produces plastics. Uh, he's based in Bielefeld and produces plastics to all the car industry. Um, he has a lot of different clients. He said, well, Jesus, we were founded 250 years ago. We, we have suffered, uh, and obviously we were talking about the car industry. Car industry is not doing great at the moment, as, as you, you will know. And he was saying, well, we have discussed that within the family. And then in my family, we have survived Napoleon Wars, the Franco-Prussian War, two world wars, the Spanish flu, 1929 crash, obviously 2028 20, crash. So uh, we will be able to cope with this. Perhaps they won't, but that gives them confidence to do it. Um, so at the end of the day, we need to fight these negative tendencies and, and open our minds to another reality that might be there, right? And how could we do that? Um, a very practical example I have seen in some families, I would say not, not all of them, but in some families, is that every board should have a committee that systematically and continuously identifies potential risks faced by the company. And I would suggest that not only in times of pandemic, but as an exercise that the board, you know, from time to time could do. So, it often helps to brainstorm the threats and rank them. How, how would you rank them? So we could, we could rank them in first, how likely is the threat to occur, okay, first, and then how costly it will be uh, to recover from it. And we can make just a cross analysis on this is very likely or very unlikely, very costly or inexpensive. Based on that, we have to start considering the threats one by one, and obviously starting with those who are likely costly threats and working our way to un un unlikely inexpensive threats. Where we could put the pandemic? Well, the pandemic should, will be an unlikely event, but a very costly event. So it would be, I would say, in the middle, just, just to put an example. Um, one of uh, and one, one of the strategies that I, I most admire, um, I once read that um, in terms of disruption, we have to prepare our business to survive and then survive on our own, ter on our, our own, own terms, or if not, to improve our capacity for independent action. And how do you do that? So the competition for limited resources to satisfy these desires May, may, may force you to, one, diminish an adversary's capacity for independent action, two, deny him the opportunity to survive on his own terms, or three, make it impossible for him to survive at all. And then in these times, whoever can survive the quickest rate of change is the one who survives. And now is a time of rapid change. So we really need to think out of the box we really need to have a very in-depth discussion within our family, within our boards, and I will talk about that in a moment. Uh, if we're doing the right things in order just not to make a better profit, but we're talking about survival. I was talking with the Minister of Economy, with the ex-Minister of Economy of Spain uh, just like a week ago, and he was saying, well, you know, the first analysis we did um, of the crisis was that it was a liquidity crisis. Um, however, now the vaccine is being delayed, at least in Europe. The, there is a new third wave we didn't expect. All the GDP estimates are 
worse than we thought about. And therefore, this liquidity crisis is changing its nature in a solvency crisis. More and more, companies will face solvency problems, not just liquidity problems. So direct help is needed in sometimes immediately, in some countries especially, so that a lot of countries don't, don't, don't go chapter 11. Um, that's just a call to remind us that um, the crisis is worse than we thought, at least economically, I'm saying, um, and we have to take actions. And there's gonna be a gap because at least in Europe, and let me just make a, a bracket here, uh, in Europe, the recovery funds, they are not going to come um, next month. It will be a delay when you present the plans. Uh, and then until, I don't know, August, September, the real money won't be granted. And therefore there is a, a, a gap. And a lot of families were waiting until March to say, hey, the economy is gonna recover. Um, I could do it, but a lot of companies might not be able to long more than much. And that's a real fact. Um, so what are, what are the, these survival needs that uh, a company uh, has to have in, in, in really, really to, to, to cope with this, um, with this crisis? And again, um, I'm not being pessimistic, I'm not being optimistic. As Stockdale, I'm being in the middle, okay? So we need at least four things. Um, and that's what I have seen in, in, in some examples in some families from, from my membership that have really you know, set an example on, on how to do things. One is a long-term survival orientation. Two is a high functioning management team. And I will talk about, uh, about them in detail now. Three, a high functioning board of directors and four, a cohesive ownership group. If you have this, you will be able to cope with the crisis in much better conditions than those who don't think about those issues. The first, <coughs> sorry. The first one is a long-term survival orientation. Um, that's what we have always called the long-term vision of the family business owners. Uh, that we talk more about sustainability of business and family, and we are not always thinking about the short-term profitability uh, of the business, as um, most uh, listed companies do because they have to comply with quarters. They think in quarters, not in generations, as we family business do. Um, but obviously, it's not easy to do it. There is a, a big and important debate uh, in the EU. We are being part of this debate right now, I don't know if you heard about this uh, corp uh, sustainable corporate governance initiative and uh, another bracket here. And there, there's been a consultation and a study made by a, uh, one of the big four. Uh, and the analysis they've done is that uh, most companies in Europe um, are, are short-term focused. We think that this vision is not, is not right because there is a lot of family companies in, in Europe. Uh, our estimate is roughly between 70 and 80%. And even if they're listed, the ownership group within the family grants the long-term perspective and the long-term vision because the ownership group, even if it's a 20% in a listed company, grants uh, this long-time horizon much better than if uh, the ownership is very diverse. So we really think that um, we cannot just generalize and say that most companies in, in Europe um, have a, a short-term virus. And I close the bracket. Uh, another, another element for this long-term uh, business orientation is to be prudent uh, with financial demands on the business. Uh, that means cr create equity, reinvesting appropriately. Um, here is something that I think Europe might do better. A lot of countries, they have a, what we have named a debt bias, which is that uh, tax-wise, they promote companies and even individuals to get indebted, but we, we are not promoting companies to increase its equity positions. And fiscally uh, is worse treated, most generally in Europe. 
And that's not good because in terms like this, those who have a good equity position can really um, hold the, the boat and, 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 and get through the tempest. Those who don't have a good equity position are really having uh, not only liquidity problems, but solvency problems. Finally, um, we have to consider the way that business is organized and, and manage the tension between organizing for stable times or for periods of change. It has nothing to do the way you organize a business in a stable time and a periods of change. And I have to say, uh, within this reality, not now, but you know, with this technology advance uh, uh, in, in, in last, I would say, decades, uh, most of the periods are periods of change. So we really need to adapt ourselves to that situation. Another survival need, not just a, a my possible, we could have one. No, it's a survival need. It's a high functioning management team that scans for future disruption and discuss approaches to any disruptions identified. What do I mean by that? We have a team that can communicate quickly and openly about anything. And what is communication? Well, you might have heard about all, all, all types of theories about communications, but um, at least in my experience with families, um, and that's not only applied to families uh, or inner uh, relations within the business, but as well in, in individuals, the three main characteristics of a good uh, relationship in communication is a frequent communication, long communication, and where you can talk about any topic at all, where there are no taboos. So frequent, long, you can discuss everything. Those business owners who have that dynamic within the family, they will be able to really talk about everything in the board and say, hey, let's talk about if, if there is a possible pandemic. Let's talk about possible threats that the company might have. Let's have an open discussion about that. And again, I have seen this past year, most of the companies that I have been talking to, they have, uh, and especially those who are long, I mean, large families, um, or large businesses with a lot of employees, they have extremely developed their communication system. They saw that if there is a lack of communication either within the family or within the business, uh, in these times where physical contact was not possible, um, the direction of the business may be in danger. So they have incredibly increased the way to communicate intranets, um, obviously um, the Zooms of this life, um, but at the same time, they have structured the way that in, in which they communicate. So again, that's a very good practice I've seen in, in, in very good family companies, enhance the communication system so that um, no matter what, even if it's online, there is a good flow of communication in, in the family. A third survival need I have seen is that, um, that you, you need to have, and no matter how, how big you are as a company, you need to have a high functioning board of directors. Call it what, whatever you want to call it. If you're a small business, you can have an advisory board, uh, but you need a sounding board. You need someone uh, that holds management accountable. Um, and the owner alone cannot do it properly. And you need a body that actively identifies and explores all sources of risk faced by the enterprise. And that's the value added for the board. Uh, the board is the next to last defense against unseen internal and external threats. And in the board, you discuss strategy, you discuss um, the future of the company. Um, and for that, you need a sounding board with the right profiles. And it's not now uh, time to talk about good corporate, corporate governance, but I think it's very important to really, you know, bear, bear that in mind to really um, consider this is another survival need. 
And the final one um, that we think is basically a cohesive ownership group that has a shared and compelling purpose. Here, the purpose is what drives really um, the cohesion uh, between the owners. The, the, the purpose gives meaning to sacrifice and suffering, which are needed to build great and sustainable families and businesses. The purpose shields against selfishness, infighting, and the degenerative effects of an amplified sense of entitlement. And finally, the purpose helps ensure that the pursuit of being personally productive is seen as more important and gratifying than satisfying hedonistic desires. Purpose is perhaps one of the most important elements that I have seen in the families that last, in the families that succeed generation through generation. Um, I will put an example of a business owner I know very well. Um, he has two families from mother's side and father's side. On his father's side, he, he owns a real estate listed company now transformed in, a, in, a, in an energy company, a huge company. Uh, well, he said it in public, so I could say, is Jose Manuel Entre Canales, Acciona from Spain, Acciona, he has a company. And his mother had another company, it's called Domec. The Domec family, more than 2000 shareholders, they sold it, okay? And he said, well, you know, what I really lack from that part of my mother's side, the fact of selling the company uh, deprived the family of having a common purpose. And without that common purpose, the family cannot disintegrate it. We are not linked anymore as we used to be when the business was there because the business gave us a purpose. Not all businesses manage to give a purpose to a family, but if the family wants to, and really, again, if you really want to survive, you need to, th you need to think about what is your purpose as a family and why do you want to have this business? Um, here, I would like to make a, a, a short stop and, and be open for questions, if there are any, or more than questions, perhaps someone who would like to share an experience or a good experience that, that you know, might resonate based on what I said. So I would like just to hear from you so that I don't talk uh, all the time. Anyone would like to share or make a question? No? Okay, so let, let's, um, let's continue. I have a question, Jesus, if, if, if that's all yes, right. Yes, Peter, I of course, yeah. When we, uh, Salvo is going to give a talk and I'm going to interview with him regarding um, strategy, but the big thing to me is the how question. And I think it's very important what you said, of giving purpose to the family and um, getting them to have a common purpose linked together because that means the family will stay together and face threats together. Mm -hmm. How would you do that? Define the common purpose? Hmm. Well, you need to, you need to, um, let me put you an example uh, that I know. It's, it's a very special family. It's called, sorry, but I, I, as I know a lot, some of examples, I think sometimes it's better to explain that. Uh, Mulia family. The Mulia family is a family that owns, uh, well, they, ha they are more than a thousand shareholders. Rania, I know that uh, she, she knows them well. They're based in Lille. Um, and um, they, uh, within those a thousand shareholders, they asked each and every one of them in the family, and then Dania, you could complement what I say. And they did that exercise, um, I think that three, four years ago uh, through the Association Familiar Moulier. And that exercise made them um, put in a, that was an exercise of six months, I think. So every single family was interviewed, what, what is the purpose of the company? What are the values of the company? What do you think should be the vision? What do you think should be the mission? 
they all gave their insight and there was a com an effort from this association familiar Mulier to detect what was in common on all of them and um, finally it came with um, two or three concepts I if I remember if I remember right one was uh, to focus uh, the the human both the human being the man as as the importance of uh, 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 very important for the company. That means you know the talent should be protected. Uh, two was time. We could be patient. We could really allocate time, uh, and and together we we we've done real things in the past. By the way, this this is a company that uh, is the owner of Decathlon, uh, Leroy Merlin, um, Auchan. I mean, it's one of the top business uh, owners in, in France. And they did it, the exercise as such. But please, Rania, as we have the pleasure of having you here, perhaps you would like to compliment what I said. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what you said, uh, Jesus, is completely right. And uh, now they have their vision for 2035, and all the members were included in the project. So it's important to give a voice to every family member and to remember what values bind the family members together. And based on that, look into the future. So uh, for this, the family needs to invest time, to invest money, to invest in building structures. Of course, this family has uh, many shareholders, as you said, around a thousand. Some other families uh, may have less shareholders, but the exercise could be the same on a smaller scale. So uh, yeah, I totally relate to what you said, Jesus. Purpose is key and purpose needs to be defined by involving all the members in the journey and taking the time it needs. It doesn't uh, come up like this, you know, over uh -huh. a meeting. It can take sometimes two to three years, but once we know where we are going all together, then uh, we know how to plan for it. Uh, while also keeping in mind that where we're going to go together depends a lot on uh, where we come from. So it's the past, the present, and the future all interlinked. Really completely agree, completely agree. And then the purpose is not just the effort of the, the founder or the owner, because this will not give the purpose uh, a long-term view for the future. It's only the past, right? So as very well Rania said, uh, we have to combine both past, present, and future. Can I say, ask a question, Jesus? This is from sure. uh, does it mean that one has to diversify the business into new lines to improve and to meet the challenges, or just revise the structures, as you said, and also Rania mentioned, by involving one and all into the process? Well, this is a this is this is not a general question. I think that we we should. Uh, I mean, it very depends on uh, what type of business. What, what is the environment you, you live in, you have to compete with? Uh, what is um, um, your, your line of the complexity of the business together with the complexity of the family at some point? So there is a lot of factors. I cannot say you will have to diversify your lines of business um, as a general rule. I, I wouldn't say that. But we have experts in the, in the room, so I'm happy to, to be complimented. What do you think, Joe? Anyway, Salvo. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I completely support what you were saying, and independent from the size of of the family, you always have to keep the family in the business project. Uh, one of the mistakes that frequently I see in family business uh, leaders is that at a certain point, they start giving for grant uh, the, uh, the equity that the family has invested in yeah. the business. They give for grant and they don't make the difference between uh, only uh, handling their own individual family business or owning uh, a collective business. Uh, the chairmen uh, uh, and the CEOs of a listed company do an incredible effort in gaining daily the, the trust 
of, of their shareholders. And uh, in, in family businesses, uh, I've seen too many times uh, uh, forgetting about the need you have to mm -hmm. keep your shareholders in the, yeah. in the mood in somehow. And uh, you can do that in very different way to go back to Peter uh, message. But the point is you need to have moments in which you meet the family and uh, where as Rania was saying, you give them voice, voice to express what are the benefits they expect from the business, either directly or indirectly, either financially or not. What are the uh, resources they are willing to contribute to the business and how do they think they are in balance or unbalanced? Because mm -hmm. the, 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 the ability of a family together in bad moments mostly depend on how much they value the effort of doing that on the one hand, but also on the ability they have to work together as a cohesive team. And this is not gained in bad moments. You have to do that in good moments mm -hmm. if right. you want to have that work in bad moments. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm completely uh, in, in your line. You need to, and the example of large businesses can very well be learned by smaller business. Mm -hmm. Because there was one question I wanted to ask you when you were speaking about the board of directors. And, it's, and I was thinking large family businesses are very frequently using properly their boards of directors. And uh, do you think that could be useful also for medium-sized companies? Well, absolutely. <clears throat> there is no I, doubt. I mean, I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, obviously, we have to... Um, we cannot compare the board that perhaps a large company uh, might have uh, with, with a small or a medium sized company. Um, in, a, in a very small company, uh, um, we might start with an advisory board where uh, you know, um, we use some external advice from someone uh, out of the family. We, 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 we cannot dream of getting um, the XEO of uh, General Electric in our board, okay, as a, as a listed company. But between that and not having anyone and just being the family, there is a lot of possibilities, right? And um, I, I, I don't think that, well, um, having your best friends in your team or your lawyer in, in your board will help, will help you really to take the best decisions um, with another vision and, and, and thinking out of the box. So, Yes, definitely. We, I, I really support the idea of, of having a, a board um, and every single stage of the company might change and then we might introduce more external, uh, independent directors uh, and more external help. But yes or yes, um, the structure, the procedure in which a, a board functions, uh, it's always beneficial for a company. That's what I think. There's yeah. one small comment that can I, if I can make, Jesus, is that Salvo and I did a joint article for some businesses in Boston on a 10-point plan for surviving the pandemic. And one of the one of the points, I guess, was to think about our customers. It's interesting. Sometimes I ask a business person what business they're in, and they tell me what they're selling, not what the customer's buying. Do you understand? Yeah. And sometimes mm -hmm. we think we're selling product when, in fact, our customer's buying the service and expertise. So sometimes it's, it's good in this pandemic. We've said one of the points is for the owner of the manager of the company, the family business, to go and visit the major customers where, you know, you can Pareto, a small number of customers give us 80% of our turnover and profit and mm -hmm. go and visit them, understand their problems and help develop solutions, which is our part of our survival package. Yeah, correct. Well, I promise not to interfere today. No, I'll, uh, I'll no, go no, quiet. no, no. And that's on the contrary. I think these discussions uh, are enriched by the uh, by this, I guess, by this uh, debate. On the contrary, I think listen. I absolutely agree. Listen to the customer is is, is essential if you want to survive. Uh, not focusing only on what you can produce better, right? Well, this it's where great. innovation comes from, and and it's interesting the point that you make about that German company asking uh, their employees to think for an hour. I mean, 3M used to have skunk works, didn't they? You know, you could <laughs> develop a you, you presentation, you get 15% of your time to come up with great ideas. And I think that in my experience of innovation, uh, some really great innovations have come from the front line, not from the people wearing shirts and ties. 
Um, yeah. So it, there's a whole issue about that. And I think that uh, when we talk about values, to me, values, which I, we've put in the handbook, Tavonoi, the, are the rudders of the business, the, how we behave. And they're how we behave in good times and not good times. Uh, but I think, quite frankly, one of them that I like is treating people with respect, irrespective of the status. And that, that way, the people who contact our customers to come up with some really good ideas about what their needs are, Correct. But I fully endorse what uh, Salvo says about the board and about having a shared purpose and all in this together and being positive. Mm -hmm. So this is where leadership comes. And um, and anyway, thank you for your comments. And I think they're very valuable, as they always are, old friend. Thank you, Peter. There is uh, sure. an interesting uh, question by Flam Arnaud. Oh, right. Sorry, I didn't see the chat. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so yes, please. <laughs> Uh, uh, the question is, in our board of directors, we have so, yeah. brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, not not professional, professional, but it gives importance to those who don't have a managerial position. You mentioned the quality of the board is crucial. How are successful family businesses uh, professionalizing their board? Okay, perfect. That's a very good question. May I... May I answer this question with a couple of quiz that I was planning and then I will go back to the question. So here, I just wanted you to read this carefully for three minutes, okay? And then I will answer your question and perhaps there are more questions that will arise. So just think about this and apply to your desired family structure at some point. Okay, so I think you, you all have read it. Um, let me answer Arnaud in, in, in that sense. I will answer with, for instance, this question. Are all members of your board uh, able to meet the demands of the company in the next five, 10 years? Are your brothers and sisters gonna help uh, your, your parents to go where you want to go in the next 10 years? Or do you think you need extra help to do it. And, and I'm, not, I'm not going to answer for you. You will have to answer for yourself. If you think that's enough, it's fine. If, if you really think that you're missing some of the capabilities that will get you there where you want to go, you need, you need to, to seek external advice and, and external input in your board. Uh, I will just put an example of um, the CEO of Russell Reynolds, who once was uh, in a conference, I invited him and he said, well, the wrong, the wrong thing that a lot of companies, even listed, huge listed companies are doing is that they choose the CEO based on the experience, based on what the company needs uh, right now. But a good CEO, uh, a good company should per first um, think about what they want to be in the next 10 years and define the skills of the person that will get them there. And then we will look for that profile. And again, this is the same with the board members. So if you have that competence insight, it's fine. Um, if not, you will have to supplement, I would say, with, with some external uh, uh, help. Um, and well, those, those are just questions that may help you reflect about, you know, what, what are you missing? In, what is missing in your board? What is, what is there that you might get better? Um, do you have a strategic plan? Do you really talk about strategy in the board? Or is a board that is talking most of the days about managerial day-to-day -day issues 
and not the long-term perspective. Don't forget that um, the essence of a, of a good board is to talk about strategy. If you're not talking strategy, something wrong is in the board. Well, Arnaud, I, I guess I have answered your question. And if not, I'm, I'm happy to, to just interrupt and then let me know if I can help you. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, okay. Um, another, another, another list of self-reflective questions I would like you to think about. And obviously, if there's any, any other question, I'm happy to create a dialogue. Uh, what about this uh, ownership? to create a cohesive ownership group. Just uh, if you please read about this for a few minutes. Okay, so <clears throat> that that is some quiz um, of are you really having a cohesive ownership model or or you're not um, you're not creating that sense of community within your com within your family to really talk about even purpose together. So if is there any questions about that? Because if not, I will go through uh, the next part of the of, of the session, which is the um, some myths about family business. I will go very quickly because this is going to be the introduction for me for for the next uh, for for the next uh, thing I want to share with you. Well, some some myths about family businesses. I don't know if you've heard about that from previous presentations, but um, well, sorry for that. Uh, some one one of them is that family businesses are, are always small and medium sized. Okay, I guess that uh, all of you here know about um, big family companies, obviously in Europe, but perhaps you won't know that you you have the numbers that that the Wallenbergs in Sweden control more than fifty percent of the market cap, or that twenty groups in India they have sixty percent of the private sector assets. Or the Ayala family, only one family have 25% of the market cap in Philippines, right? So there are just very concrete examples to say that, hey, family company, that, and excuse me, but I always use that um, sometimes for, for the politicians who really misunderstood what a family business is, right? Another one is that um, family businesses are normally less efficient than large non-family multinationals. And that's, that's so far from reality, right? Um, it's, it's, um, um, there's been studies uh, everywhere that, that really show how the efficiency of the family uh, business model is even better than the non-family business model. Um, there was in, in concrete terms a study, uh, EY, it's a, it's a bit old, this one in 2017, and you have the numbers there. I don't have to explain every single item of it, but the performance of family companies, if you see there in jobs created, in turnover growth, in cash flow growth, it's always better, except in the return on earnings, it's always better than, uh, sorry, again, no, it's, it's, it's always uh, bigger in family businesses than in non-family businesses, even in return on earnings. And the, and the last one, uh, the last myth that we've heard about family companies is that they, they last less than not family companies. Uh, that's based on a study that John Ward did, you know, some time ago. Um, and he compared the, the family business uh, third generation, third generation uh, um, typical um, average of survival to the number of companies from Standard Pools or the McKinsey 1000 that lived uh, for the same time. 
and and there uh, we saw that you know standard pool had uh, much less much less uh, number of companies that lasted 50 years or 47 years than than the, the, the average of family companies and therefore um, they last even longer they are more efficient uh, they are not always small so it's a model where we can learn from but in concrete terms what i'm going to talk about is three types of companies that um, i've been following um, and that for me are very good examples of what other Euro European or world companies could do based on their example. One is the Nokia. I have already explained what the association is, so I don't have to explain it again. I've been, I've been invited to a lot of meetings from them. Well, there is Peter von Meller. He's uh, here in the front line. He's the, one of the guys I've talked to you about. Um, all of them, they have more than 200 years. It's, it's a world organization. They have people from Japan as well. And um, there was a study um, made by um, INSEAD where uh, based on the interviews of the whole group, they decided to analyze what were the key um, elements that made those type of companies, um, well, last longer than others. And uh, that there were basically these four four um, four items. One was to really identify the family assets and push them and 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 based on them. What are the assets? The name, the reputation, the experience, um, the contacts, both both in business side and the political side. Um, so those the values of the family those are the the assets first we have to identify them then cherish them and then use them to really um, push the family together as a cohesive group again another another of the characteristics of these uh, 200 and more years old companies were how they overcome the obstacles um, they they have this confidence I was talking about from Peter von Miller. And then they, um, obviously, if, if there was the death of someone or the succession, the sudden succession, there was a family obstacle, they would overcome and they don't know how to do it. Uh, and even they, they know how to plan it before it happens. Market obstacles, you, you could be out of, out of business. You have to change your line of business sometime. Uh, to, to really adapt to, uh, to, to, to the new conditions. Or even institutional, it could be a new regulation, a new government, a new type of state at some point. Um, and, and, and even though they overcome that obstacles. The third element that uh, Peter was referring to before that, that was they are extremely innovative. Um, they, they reinvent the wheel uh, of what a company should be sometimes each generation. And I always like to put here the example of the Senya family. Um, perhaps you, you, you all know the uh, Hildo Senya, they, they made uh, suits, the Italian company. They started, the grandfather started um, more than 200 years ago, um, importing the best wool from, uh, from Australia. And they, they were just selling wool. The following generation, they say, hey, you know, instead of only selling wool, why don't we produce uh, and sell, but you will have to correct me this because this is an Italian example. If I'm wrong, you let me know. Uh, but, uh, and then they said, okay, let's, let's produce um, um, tissue, right? The best tissue you can ever find, best quality, fine, so on. The following generation, uh, the M -M they said, hey, let's, let's do something else. Let's, let's do suits, right? And then, from suits, we'll go into you know a sport shoes and, and watches and other thing. And, and this is the third generation. And the fourth generation, I, 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 I know Paulo Senya, and once I, I was with him and his daughter. Um, and then I asked him, well, so this is the story I've been told of this eighth generation, you do something different. So what is the next generation gonna, gonna do? And um, his daughter was there and he said, 
well ask her you know i don't know <laughs> so um i asked her and she said well all the questions were very clear we are going to go into environmentalism i don't know what it is i mean uh they just want to cope with uh, environmental issues and make the company obviously with this new trend uh, be sustainable in that sense but again they wanted to be innovative they cannot they cannot avoid the sustainability issues that you have to cope with these years again the next generation of the seniors they were saying hey we have to go with the time if we want to survive um and then salvo uh, do you want to comment on that or not or because i know you i'm sure you know the family no okay well and then finally the you gave a perfect picture of, of this of this uh, family and their business and uh, on how you can really reinvent your business in the in the present time mm -hmm. you don't need to completely change the uh, industry or sector what some companies have done think about the falk family mm -hmm. the falk family was in the iron industry when they understood the, the dramatic changes the iron industry, the iron sector was experiencing, they understood there was not going to be more space for them in, the, in that industry. And uh, they sold their business, so they liquidated part of their business and they started a new business, taking advantage of what they had learned about energy production mm -hmm. in their iron uh, uh, plants. And now they are a quite successful group uh, in uh, the in uh, innovative energies. Mm -hmm. So right. this yeah. is exactly how you can evolve leveraging on what you know, what you have learned as a family in business from your uh, previous experience, but always looking at how the world around you evolves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Salvo. You're welcome. And then the final, the final item of this, um, I mean, every, obviously each family does in its own way. And this is uh, just creating category, abstract category of something which is a very concrete example. But the last item is planning succession for longevity. Um, you just don't plan succession for one generation, for one more generation. No, they, they have a long-term. They, they say, we want, I mean, not, it was not there at the beginning, but, uh, and this is something that factual, once you're in the fourth generation, each generational shift is easier than passing from the first to the second to the second to the third. Normally those changes, as you change from an individual perspective to a siblings, uh, to siblings uh, group, to a con consortium of cousins, the culture changes completely. But then from causes from causes consortium in the third generation or in the fourth or the fifth, you add complexity to the system, but the culture of uh, us and others has already changed and therefore is normally um, easier to make the generational shift. So those families, once they've been there, you know, they have planned the succession for, for long term. And what do they have in common? Just, uh, I will go quickly on that one, but again, the purpose. Uh, we have talked about the purpose a lot, so I won't, I won't be long on that, but they, they see the leader as the guardian, the administrator. There is a reputation to maintain. There is a name to maintain. There is a legacy uh, you have to respect, okay? And, and that is uh, um, everything within the purpose of, 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 the, of the family. But as, again, you need to have policies. Um, and at, at, at some point, these policies could be led to a document, which we could call constitution or protocol. Uh, but if not, you could just have some um, ways uh, and rules of doing things, right? But those policies will never work without the good process. So the policies, kind of the rules, uh, are the engine, but uh, the process is, is the oil. Um, and you cannot work one with the other. You can, you can create a board, even you can create a, a family council. But if the process doesn't lead to good discussions, to good communication, uh, a good governance, 
you take notes, there is an agenda, there is a good decision making, you will never be able to have um, an operative governance system if the process is not the right one. So those families have the three of them very well structured and very well functioning. Um, and as, uh, as, as a good friend of mine and, and a very good consultant in this field, uh, Ivan Landsberg, he, he, he always tends to say, well, uh, when the family evolves, we tend to less use the pistol and use more the smile, okay? So it's not the force, it's not the rules, it's the smile, it's the seduction, it's let's do things together because we want to be together. It's just a metaphor, but I, I think you can get it. Um, finally, um, well, what do we have these families? And that's very concrete based on what I just said. A good and well-defined succession plan, good governance, a family employment plan, and the opportunities for the rest of the family at some point to, to have a participation in the business, being in the management and the governance as a, as a responsible shareholder, at least there has to be a connection with, with the business, right? Uh, obviously, the more family shareholders there are, uh, I think you have, you have seen that in previous seminars, the less involvement in the management there will be, but more in the governance or in the shareholder uh, structures. Um, so those are kind of um, my, my, um, cons my, my ideas, what I've learned uh, after having talked uh, with, with these families. Um, and I think, you know, there's something that even if you are a young family, you can learn from uh, and, and put in practice. Um, let, let's have a quiz of three minutes again, in that sense. I would like you to, to reflect on this, just, just read them and, and see if there is something that resonated with you, you think that you could do better. Okay, so that's one, and that's another one on possible family problems. Now we're talking about these issues. I will, I will share this presentation so you don't have to take notes of that. It's just <clears throat> for you to reflect, to see if there is something tonight you want to discuss within your family, with, the, with your wife, with your brothers and sisters, whatever. And think if, you know, out of this presentation, you might have at least one idea that you could do better. That's my only purpose. Okay. Any questions? So far, Jesus. Yes. First of all, thank you for this gold information you are sharing with us today. <laughs> thank you. And to your last uh, questions, to your last screens shared with us. This one. The, the of the planning, five to ten years, and all the other questions. My guess would be no for many of the participants because. It's challenging to. I know, I know, I, but I, I wanted to challenge you again as well. But it's perfect <laughs> because these are eye openers, and we, it gives us now something to to work on. So we'll have a lot of, of homework you. to do. And regarding the family problems, that is a complex one. One of the questions is how do you use the family to resolve or avoid conflicts? Sometimes there are two faces to to this uh, of a coin to this uh, question. One mm -hmm. of them is that the family will resolve the conflict because of the hierarchy of the family and respect, etc. So usually the, the, the parents intervene and uh, 
because of respect. Mm -hmm. How can I say this? The respect by the arguing siblings uh, is great for the parents is greater than the argument they have between them. Sure. Um, on other times, it's challenging because, like uh, children who are um, three years old, they they try and get the attention from of the parents from the other sibling. This is this grows with with us, so, mm -hmm. so it's not easy to resolve uh, an argument between siblings by involving the parents because both arguing siblings want to have the parents side with them. <laughs> So yeah. this is a, a challenge we all face. Mm -hmm. There might be solutions mentioned today by your kind self and even your colleagues in the past webinars of having an external uh, input. Mm -hmm. But when there isn't, you can have either of both. So either it goes well or it becomes a bit more sour. Correct. That is my that is my take. Yeah, thank Thanks you again Kevin. for, for yeah. being here today with us. Thank you, my pleasure. But you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. Um, and if there is a conflict, uh, there is. You, you, I don't. I don't agree. You always need an external help. Uh, an external help might be useful. Might be useful. But as well, um, what is useful is you, as a family, and doesn't have to be a business family. In my family, as well. You need to, at some point, establish some uh, conflict resolution rules. Like, you know, um, I always tell to my wife, you know, there is a rule in this house. We will never go to sleep before solving a conflict. You never go to sleep without talking something. Before sleeping, we have to solve whatever. If you sleep with it, uh, it, gets in, it gets deeper. So yeah. just face it. Talk about it. We have to face it. Don't just yeah. go somewhere else. There's people who say, I go to a hotel. No, 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 no. We have to discuss that today before before we sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a rule. Just a very silly example, but you can you can implement rules to solve conflicts. Can I can I share something which might help uh, a number of families? Of course. Is, of course. Very, that's what, a, very that's... Sharp, a very sharp, short three-letter word in the English vocabulary. It's called ego. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of conflicts, I think, even from experience, is because of the ego being challenged. Mm -hmm. I am following a, an amazing author. His name is Eckhart Tolle. Oh, yes, um, of course. I know him very well. Yeah. From The Power of Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He highlights and makes the individual become aware of his ego and ideally to separate himself from the ego when there is a conflict. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. in reality, it's the ego which is becoming offended and not the individual. And this has uh, changed a lot for me. So, so I try and become aware if there is a disagreement, am I offended or, or is my ego being um, challenged? Just wanted to share that. that Absolutely. You could, can you tell the, the, exactly the name of the book for, for the audience to, uh, to know it's about the it? Now. Sorry? The Power of Now. The Power Correct. of Now. This is the one. The Power of Now from Eckhart Tolle. T O L L L L E, right? Yeah. T O L L L E. Amazing. That's, there are that's also very good YouTube, book. The power of now. That's there are a lot of uh, short um, interviews on YouTube. So for people who don't have time to read, mm -hmm. whilst being maybe stuck in traffic, they can uh, listen to to this um, yeah, wise. Absolutely. Man. And there is also a new word. I haven't I haven't read that. But but the power of now will be enough to solve conflicts before they arise, if the arguing the two arguing uh, factions are aware of of this teaching. Yeah, that's a very good book. I agree. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anyone else? Before I continue, may sure, Salvo, please. May I also? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, I'm completely in the line uh, of what has been said before. But I also think that an important point in, in families, uh, in business, is to try to diagnose the conflict that is going on. Because there, mm -hmm. are, there exist different types of conflicts. There are uh, conflicts uh, for, uh, which are called cognitive, uh, and they can be either for the goal or for the process. 
and there are also relational conflicts. So mm -hmm. it's very important to, to understand in which type of conflict are you. And another point is try to, uh, to divide in somehow to make a distinction between uh, uh, the, the, the conflict, the dispute and litigation. So you need to try to detect conflict uh, at the early stages because many often the, the, the conflict becomes relational because of uh, repeated unresolved conflicts as you Jesus were mentioning. Uh -huh. You need to have a policy that you will try not to mistreat people. You will try to fix issues when they emerge. You will try to uh, discuss these agreements before they become uh, the source uh, of relational conflicts. Mm -hmm. And there is also another, another sort of enemy, which is prejudice. In families, uh, uh, many times uh, people have bad relations because of prejudice. They don't know uh, each other the way they are now. They can know one, uh, one another because of previous misbehavior of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, those type of conflicts reemerge after three or four generations in certain mm -hmm. families, or because of they had a, a not good relationship in their infancy or in their adolescence. And then when, when they become adults, even though they are brother and sister or brothers or they are cousins, they continue treating them uh, as if they were. So you need in somehow to create conditions that makes the relationship uh, evolve uh, with uh, the adulthood of people, even though mm -hmm. they are members of the same family. And there is a mix of all those things. So you need, for instance, to teach your family members to discipline their ego <laughs> and, to, and to balance their ego with the uh, need for uh, having respect for the homos, for the common house, which is the business. Uh -huh. yeah. So education is another important part of, of what we're discussing about. Totally agree, absolutely. Thank you, Salvo, for your wise work. words, as always. <laughs> Thank may, you. May, may I share a point? That's sure, so sure, please. Uh, in my hotel career, my boss once taught me a very important principle. And to say that defense is the best method of attack. So when I used to see that the clouds on the horizon boiling up, as Salvatore is saying, you see, I used to attack the root of the problem before it exploded into a storm, you see. So mm -hmm. at that point in time, you may find your enemy at a weak point, you see, before starting to beef up all the attacks against you, you see. So usually I used to nip them in the bed, in the bed, uh, nip in the bud. It's before even the storm rises. So then, you know, when it's raining, I have my umbrella and I have everything <laughs> to protect me. So it was, I think it's a good principle. Yes, what all is saying, you know, to 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 attack and not to de to defend yourself. The best way is to attack the problem mm -hmm. at its root. And if you take as this weed, I had some so much root to to uh, so much weed to, to remove of the rain. So so how hope doesn't grow again? You see. But if you just uh, take off the surface, then next next week is going to be another big big plan to remove. You see? So I think it's attacking at the roots, as what I was saying, will maybe save um, a more heavy problem in the future. You see? Yeah, Thank totally you. agree. Another way of expressing that is avoiding a problem is not finding an solution. And a lot of people try to avoid the problem and just hide it and let let the problem solve uh, itself. And, and that sometimes happens, but rarely happens. Not, not, it's, not, it's not a normal case. Okay, so let's, let's go perhaps, um, uh, that's a, another example, because I guess in the audience, there's not many people from more than 200 years old, but I'm sure that there are um, some things that could resonate uh, as an example of, of uh, this example of Japanese long-lasting companies. And let me, let me explain you why. Um, the, it's, it's very short on Japanese, uh, but uh, it struck me because there is things that we could learn from them. Um, the Bank of Korea made a study uh, that's it's, it's, it's a little bit old already, but it doesn't matter because they wanted to study 
uh, the uh, companies uh, that in the world had more than um, 200 years old precisely, there are more than 5,000 in the world and 3,000, 3,000 are Japanese. And the Bank of Korea had only three, the, uh, Korea, South Korea had only three. And they say, okay, let's study why, what do they have in common? Because we would like to learn at least some of the features that they've done to last 200 years, okay? So we'll go quickly through that, but I found it a very interesting study to kind of showcase resilience, which is basically what we are talking about uh, today or, or the thing that I'm trying to say here today. So what are the lessons we could learn from them? Um, the, one, the number one is that they are devoted to the customers. Um, as Peter was saying after, uh, before, you know, ask the client, ask the client. Um, uh, they, they are anthropocentric. Uh, they focus on the talent that they have and the people they do have. Um, they believe that honesty with customers will provide loyal customers, even in a crisis, even in a crisis. So honesty uh, is, is, is essential virtue. Those are small in general. The average is 115 employees. Um, only 6% are larger than 300 employees. So we are not talking about huge companies, okay? Um, in general, they are conservative because they control growth. Um, they don't want to grow at the expense of everything. Um, I don't have the, date, the data, but uh, I don't think that any of them are listed. They just, they're not interested. Um, I don't say it's good or bad. I just say, this is the case, okay? They are internally financed and they avoid speculation. They invest in skills and loyalty of their people. Again, people, as the Mulier was saying, people is very important. Like take care of people. They believe in craftsmanship. They are dominant in small markets. 60% are uh, leader in market share. 30% are the market share leader in the country and only 13% export. Um, these companies, they have been fortunate because they've been protect in, living in a protected environment. Um, we, we have to, re you know, uh, realize that Japan was, uh, as you know, is, is an island and was the last, um, is the most endogamic culture in the world because it's the last country that was uh, conquered by any third country. The first time that... Uh, some external power entered Japan to rule was in 1945, the, the, the US with MacArthur. Not the Chinese, not the Koreans, no one has been ruling Japan before that. So that's why, well, this environment is, is, is not uh, common, common in, in, in the rest of uh, the world, but that's part of their success. Um, well, they have a special um, system of um, succession because they don't have to uh, pass it over to, to, uh, to the next generation in the family by force, but they are very comfortable adopting a son, um, right? Uh, this is as the Romans uh, used to do, right? They could adopt someone in the family and this is the successor. Um, in fact, 25% of, su of successions are to non-family those adoptive successors that I'm telling about. This, we won't do that in Europe, uh, of course, but this is what they do sometimes. And only 75% follow uh, the family lineage. And for the most part, they forbid the employment of in-laws. I'm not saying that this is the best way to do, okay? And I'm just saying that this is what they do. And finally, the ultimate purpose of the company is not the profit, but its continuation. That's something that we have been uh, listening uh, in, the, in the whole presentation because uh, this, uh, you know, at some point connecting with purpose is the two quintessential elements that makes a family really last. And that's what I wanted to share about the Japan, Japanese model. Uh, it's only that, um, I guess there are no questions because it's quite clear. Uh, it's a very special model, but you know, it's a model is, is worth knowing because uh, of its special characteristics. 
And the final model I would like to share, and I, and I know that I'm, we are we're just uh, 15 minutes ahead of, uh, of the finish of this seminar, are the hidden champions. Um, I don't know if you heard about this word, hidden champion. Um, it's, it's a term that has been created by Hermann Simon, which uh, is a German consultant. And um, he identified some companies. Um, you, you see the examples there in, in the screen. Perhaps you know some of them. I don't, I, well, I, I took the most known of them, but I'm sure that, I'm almost sure that no one of you knows all of them. Well, I'm not sure, but um, it will be difficult to, uh, Flexi, for, for instance, Flexi Bogdan is the number one company in uh, on dog leashes. Okay. Um, those who like sports will know Pog, Petzl, and Gore Tex. Um, Amorim is Cork. Um, Otto Bock is, uh, is a company producing um, extra skeletons and, and, and things for the handicapped. Firmenich is a, is a company of perfume. But they all share something. And those, this is like the characteristics of the hidden champions we're going to analyze quickly because I think we can learn from them. Um, a hidden champion is defined by a company that is number three in their sector in the continent or number three, sorry, in, in the world or one in their continent. It's a company that has a turnover of less than 3 billion euros. Okay, yeah, I mean, yes, there are some big companies, big in terms of size, but they are not huge companies. Uh, it's not, we are not talking about the Facebooks of this, of this life. So maximum 3 billion. And they are not so well known by the general public. Uh, so it's not a brand like McDonald's or, or Google, okay? So this is the definition of a hidden champion. Um, US is the home of unicorns. Unicorn being defined, as you know, as a private company with a value of uh, 1 billion or higher uh, that, that has done it in, 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 in a very short time. So you see, and that might be a little bit uh, outdated, but in general, um, USA has much more unicorns than the rest of the world. 96 in the USA, 37 in China, Eight in India, seven in the UK, and the first European country coming here is Germany with four. Um, then France with two, uh, Sweden with two, right? Um, so the EU is not, is not a great champion in, in, um, in unicorns. However, yes, it's pretty big on hidden champions. And, and I will try to analyze why. You see the numbers there. So Germany is even more than China, <clears throat> more than USA. Uh, next one is Italy, then Japan, France, <clears throat> the UK. So um, why, why is this, that's the case in, in, in the EU um, and, and perhaps not, not, not in the US? We have a different model and, and I will try to analyze why. But it happens that Germany is leading here, okay? Um, and I'm not saying that the German model is the best, but I would like to analyze the German model because there are good things there that are lessons we can learn, we all learn from them, okay? Um, see, this is based on the CIA World Fat Book. See Germany, the, the, the level of exports they do. And I say, seven years ago, Germany was position number one. USA number two and China number three. Now the world economy has changed and we have China the first, USA the second, Germany the third, Japan the fourth and France the fifth. But I would like to note the power of Germany with roughly 80 million people versus obviously China and even the USA with uh, 330 million people. Why is that? <clears throat> Why? Can Germany um, be a model to, well, some other countries around that we can learn from? And I'm, I'm telling that is not because of the country, it's because of the rules 
that has helped the creation of these hidden champions. One is the innovation capacity. We were talking about innovation later. The number of patents in 2019 of Germany was 32,000. In France, 20,000, you see there. Switzerland, 5,000. Spain, 2,000. Only Siemens has more patents than Spain altogether. Only one company in Germany. Number one. Number two, they have a strong production capacity. Industry is very strong. And the GDP in industry is 22%. Only 12% in France and the UK. Again, this is a model. It's not good or bad, but this is a model. And if you have an industry model strong, you can, you're able to produce more of these hidden champions. Number three is the evolution uh, of the cost of employment. In the Eurozone, um, in the last, the average of last year was 21%, France 25%, Germany 6.3%. That's, that's a lot of difference uh, in, in, in that regard. Finally, <clears throat> global presence. Um, you, you have seen the number of exports that Germany has. There is nothing else to say. The number five is a dual system. It's a system, uh, perhaps you've heard about it, it's a system where um, someone who doesn't want to go to university uh, is able to study one or two days a week and at the same time have practices in a company of the, the things that he or she is studying. And then at the end of the three, four years, combining these practices in a company and the, the studies, they could really uh, have a, a, a diploma a title and uh, they are certified very well recognized and totally employable. This is a system that, for instance, I know Spain uh, is trying to implement um, because of the high rate of unemployment that Spain has, especially in the, in the youth. Um, and they are um, actually, my association in Spain is promoting a lot this dual system. And finally, and with that, I finish about the German model, uh, is, um, uh, is the made in Germany. The main, well, is there a question, chat? Okay, uh, one minute feeling, okay, good. The Made in Germany. <clears throat> I don't know if you heard about the story of, about the Made in Germany. The Made in Germany, um, it was a label that was um, enforced by the uh, UK uh, in 1887 to distinguish the the British products, which in 1887, they were supposed to be the best products in the world because of the capacity that the UK had at that time in, in the industry, they had a heavy industry, very good quality products versus the rest of, 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 the, of the world, I would say, not only Europe. Um, so France had to pay it made in France, Belgium had to, had, had to put made in, made, in, um, made, made in Belgium, Germany had to put made in Germany. But at the end of the day, after 50 years, the German products uh, were having similar quality than the British products and later on had even better quality than the British products. And Made in Germany was the cheapest and best marketing campaign ever in history made by a regulation by the uh, English authorities. Just, uh, just uh, quite an anecdote on that sense. But let's, let's analyze the... Um, um, the, the keys of the hidden champions. Why, why, why are they able to, to be so keen on, on exports and so on? Because of five characteristics that I would like to briefly mention. One is they have really ambition goals. Um, they, they always want to be number one on, on, uh, in, in what they do, right? Uh, and I will put some examples later on. Focus, they, they, they want to uh, get to a niche they want to uh, do what they do best, but be the best ones in what they do. Okay, let's, let's not be too um, wide open and let's focus on what we do. They start to be global from the beginning. They innovate a lot and they have a special leadership model, which is a family leadership in more than 85% of the cases. I will go one by one very quickly and then I will be open to questions. Ambitious goals, I will put some examples here. Rit Rit sport. We do not think in years, but in generations. Uh, again, this is a very family slogan. 
3B scientific, we want to become world number one and remain in this position. Or Karl Mayer, we don't want our world market share to drop below 70%. Ambitious, ambitious goals. On the focus, a very example is Ullman. We have always had and will always have only one client, the pharmaceutical industry. We only do one thing, but we do it well. Flexibotgam, we might do only one thing, but we do it better than anyone. That's uh, the, the, the dog leashes. Um, globalization is, is well, the, 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 the orientation of a, of, a, of a typical hidden champion is from the beginning, and it's precisely in this um, online world, to, to be global. The, 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 the local market is, is not enough, and not only to sell, but to produce there. And innovation, uh, you have the number there. Uh, you have the numbers. It's amazing um, how um, they are really innovative, uh, intensive in R&D. And the number of, of patents, um, they, 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 they are by far um, number one. They are extremely innovative and that's what it makes them um, to be extremely creative and go to the niche uh, um, much better than others. And finally, um, they have a family leadership, as I was saying. Um, they are focused on, on high skilled workers um, with coaches with high grade of compliance. And if you see the number of turnover staff, it's amazing. Uh, in the US is uh, 30%, the turnover staff. It's another market, that's, that's for sure. Um, but if you go there, 2.7 the hidden champions. That's the, uh, that's the turnover rate. So what can we learn from them? And with that, I will finish and then I'm open to the, to the final questions and wrap up. But Theodore Lovett, one of the Harvard professors I, I, I really admire, um, said that sustained success is largely a matter of regularly focusing on the right things and making a ton of in, in, inconspicuous improvements every day. That's what the, this type of business, the hidden champions do. Every day focusing on the right things and just twist with good improvements. But then as well, and, and it could be applied for any of you, you don't have to build a replica of Silicon Valley to prosper. You, didn't, you don't need to be a Google of this world. You could be a small company, a niche company, and, and, and excel in the same way. So small semen niches can become global markets. And finally, your company, even if it's a medium size, can preserve highly qualified job as long as you know how to focus, globalize, and innovate. And with that, I would like to end um, my presentation saying that the family business model is a model that um, I, I would say, perhaps if I say it's superior um, it will be too arrogant because I represent them all. But I honestly think that they have characteristics that creates an essence of resilient companies uh, that are really well prepared to face this crisis and any crisis if they really plan for the long term, if they really have high um, effective boards, if they do have good processes internally that will canalize a good communication system. So in reality, I think we have talked about a lot of concrete ideas in this session. Uh, there's been a lot of great questions um, and I'm glad to answer the last, last questions if, if there are any. And if not, it's been a pleasure of, of sharing this, pres this presentation with you all. Thank you. Uh, Jesus, can I can we ask you sure. to make sure that we receive a, a copy that you kindly offered? Because uh, the, uh, we have followed all the webinar events so far, and they all, were all all amazing. This one is one of the best ones I think we personally uh, I attended. Well, thank if you. <laughs> the organizers could, could share the slides. I would be really yeah. I, I don't have any problem sharing the slides. Uh, yes. It's up to we the will, organizers. Yeah, we will. We will collect all the recording uh, of the webinars because we have recorded all the webinars, and of Understood. course we have all the slides from all the presenters. 
and we will upload all the webinars, the recorded ones with their slides in the online platform that we are now building for our spring project. So you have a collection of the 10 webinars as well as more material coming uh, of recorded uh, sessions from the team of our spring project. And uh, we will be announcing this in the following weeks once we Thank make you. our final decisions on how this will work. The kids are you know, ready to come into the room because they're bored. Um, so we really want to thank Jesus. Do you have any questions? I can see some of the comments coming and, and they're very nice comments concerning Jesus' uh, presentation. Thank you, thank you everyone. Very insightful, very practical in terms of giving us real examples of companies from all around the world. And uh, that, that's great. And uh, I would like to remain all of you, please to spend two or three minutes uh, Naya has posted in the chat a link to our online questionnaire for the evaluation of this webinar. It's the same link we use for all our webinars. Um, the title of, uh, of Jesus' um, uh, presentation was, uh, I'm just reminding you the title so that you select the right webinar, was Practical Lessons from COVID-19, the Family Business Approach. Thank you, thank you all for your nice comments. We really appreciate it and we really want to thank Jesus for doing a great job. Do we have any questions from our participants? Any comments? Anything you would like us to clarify? I just want to show you very briefly the three webinars, the fourth, four webinars that are coming up in the following four weeks. It's always the same time. It's Tuesdays, uh, 3.30 to 5.30 CET time, Central European time. And I'm just sharing uh, the schedule for the webinars coming, coming in the, during the following weeks. Next week, I will be presenting, I will be talking about the key leadership lessons for successors or family businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. I will try to make it very current and very relevant uh, to what, family businesses should consider when developing the successors and, and their leadership skills in the current environment where we're living by giving you also small exercises to do while we're doing the webinar so it's more engaging like Jesus has done today and all the previous presenters have done successfully. Then on the 16th of February, we have Mr. Andreas Kuparis. He's the executive chairman of Saiban, the Cyprus Business Angels Network. He's an investor and mentor to startups and SMEs in Cyprus and Europe. And he will be talking uh, about the issue of external investors in family business and how you can handle uh, this issue, which is very interesting for family business of having people investing who are not family uh, members. Uh, on the 23rd and on the, of February and on the 7th of March, we will be doing something completely different our coordinator, Professor Salvo Tomaselli, who's a professor at Uniba University and an international consultant on family business in the past 25 years, with Mr. Peter Jenner, um, who is uh, the um, a very experienced consultant on family business and more specific on succession programs for the uh, past 35 years in the UK and abroad will be doing an interview type of sessions where they will be giving us very interesting insight on the family business recovery post the pandemic and the next generation issues, uh, as well as family business succession planning and how to build confidence for the future. So it will be very interactive in terms of having both Professor Tomaselli and Mr. Peter Jenner together in the last two sessions. And I really hope you, you all participate in the next for uh, webinars we're planning. Uh, yes, Keith, uh, Keith Abella, that's a great comment. It's like we have fired up our version of Olympic family business flame. That's a great comment. <laughs> so do we I have- I just mentioned Celia that we mentioned everybody that we are, Hazal and I are writing together a handbook on family business succession. So we'll be explaining that in our seminar so that everybody can have a how-to process, which will be enriched by the seminars that we listen to, and particularly what we've heard today. 
Yeah, I would like also to add to what Peter is saying that we will be sharing with you a number of very insightful questions which have been developed by Peter, Salvo and the rest of the Spring team during the past two years uh, on the current state of your family business over a number of pillars which are very relevant to succession planning. And this kind of interactive interactiveness and self-reflection that we'll be going through we will all be going through in the last two sessions, I think will be very uh, useful, practical, uh, and thought provoking for all of us. So I'm just putting again the link uh, of the questionnaire in our chat. If you can spend two or three minutes, it's a very short uh, link. Uh, to give us your comments for today's uh, event. We would really appreciate it because based on your comments, we will be improving our content and our methods and the design of this program. Thank you, Jesus, for a great webinar. Pleasure. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I did. And thank you. Thank you for the help of the rest of the people participating. Uh, Salvo, Peter, Rania, yourself, and, uh, you know, very nice question. So, Nice to see that there is interest and it's an interactive. I, I, have, I, have, I have also learned a lot. So that's, that's part of the game. That's, that's the good. best, I think, when you're a guest speaker, <laughs> how much things we learn as well, right? So yeah. we look forward to welcoming, welcoming all of you next Tuesday, same time, same Zoom details. I hope you all have a great evening. And let's try all to start implementing some of the things we're learning through these webinars. That's the idea behind the whole project. Thank you all. And thank you. Thank also to uh, Lucia, who has been with us for all the time. Oh, of thank course. you, Lucia, yes. for your support. Thank, thank you, thank you Lucia. for your patience, Lucia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, webinar. Thank you. 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 Thank